So I'm going to talk about, uh, I've been working for quite a while on uh, the problem on the problem of the secondary structure of RNA, and particularly on the determination of pseudonauts, and more recently uh, on the determination and the search for knots in RNA. So this work was initiated as a collaboration with uh, Anthony Z from UCSB, and then was pursued with uh, Graziano Verditti, who many of you know, who was a postdoc in this lab. And that's for the analytical part, and for the numerical part, it was continued with my student, Mich Michael Bon, and with uh, Christian Micheletti from the CISA. So, the outline of my talk is the following. I will review some basic properties of RNA, for people who don't, many physicists don't know what's RNA. Uh, I will explain what are secondary structures. I will show how the problem can be mapped onto a matrix field theory. And from this matrix field theory, uh, it follows that there is a topological classification of RNA structures. And then, uh, depending on science, so the, the main and the most interesting thing is, of course, the algorithm for prediction of secondary structures. And uh, if I have more time, I will uh, talk about real knots in RNA. Um, so I, RNA, is there a pointer? So RNA is a biopolymer, and as you know, there are essentially four types of biopolymers in the cell. There is RNA, and it's a single-stranded polymer. DNA, which is double-stranded, it makes the famous uh, double helix, and it's much longer. It's between millions and billions of base pairs. Proteins and polysaccharides. So, and the role of RNA is that uh, you have DNA, which is transcribed into RNA, which in itself is translated into proteins, and the proteins do the biological function in the cell. There are many, so since the discovery of RNA, there has been, uh, it has been found many, many forms of RNA in the cell. And the first one which I described, which is this uh, uh, messenger RNA, which takes you from the DNA genes to the proteins represent only 5% of, of the known RNA. There are all these kind of RNAs which are very important. Uh, the recently found microRNAs are supposed to be very important in the regulation of, uh, of cellular, uh, of the biology of the cell. And many viruses are uh, viral RNA, contain RNA which can be quite long. And it has been found that uh, a lot, up to 80% of DNA, is transcribed into non-coding RNA. So RNA is, has become a very important uh, molecule in biology. And that's why there is uh, more and more people working on the determination of on, on RNA in general. So RNA is a single-stranded uh, polymer made of four bases, A, G, C, U. And there is a sugar phosphate uh, backbone, and uh, it's a negatively charged polymer. And the chemistry is that you have GCAU, and they bind like this to make three uh, hydrogen bonds, and AU makes two hydrogen bonds. So this, the GC bond is stronger than the AU bond, and there is an additional a third bond, which is the so-called wobble pair, which is the GU pair, which is a bit weaker, which is 1.5 kilograms. So anyway, that's not important. What's important is that there is these two pairings which are called the canonical Crick-Watson pair. There is this additional one, which is the Wobble pair. And all these pairings produce what's called RNA folding. So in other words, what happens is that RNA is a sequence of, of uh, bases of nucleic acid. C, A, G, C, etc. They can pair together like this, and therefore the structure will adopt uh, a certain spatial organization so that you maximize the, the total free energy of the system. And the problem of secondary structure uh, folding, or the, the RNA folding problem, as it is called, is to determine which base are paired to get together. So here, for instance, 
you have this one here, one, two, three, four, etc. So what is given is the, the biological sequence of your RNA, and you want to know what is the list of pairs. And, and this list of pairs is important because the function of RNA can be enzyme regulation, etc. And it strongly depends on the loops and the so-called pseudonauts, which I will define later. So these loops are parts of the RNA which are unpaired and which can bind to other molecules and by binding to these other molecules, uh, it triggers some biology in the cell. So the secondary structure of an RNA is the, the sequence of all pairing present in the RNA, and that's what we are looking for. So these are pictures of three-dimensional pictures of RNA. So this is a transfer, so-called transfer RNA, which is among the smallest uh, RNAs. It's about 70 base pairs, 70 bases. And this is a, a huge RNA, which is a ribosomal RNA, which is about 3,000 bases, and which won a Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2009, because uh, deciphering this kind of structure in 3D by crystallography is really uh, very challenging, and uh, it was done in the late 90s. What, what does the color mean? Sorry? What does the color mean? OK, so it's a hybridization. Here, uh, it, it's several fragments of RNA. It's not only one molecule. And it's also mixed. So you have in this ribosomal RNA, in fact, it's a complex of RNA and some proteins. So the color, so the yellow is probably the RNA, and the green part is the, complex, the, the proteins which are complex together. So but you see, to get. So it's a molecule made of about 3,000 base pair, bases. Each base is about 20 atoms, so that's uh, <coughs> 60,000 times 3, so it's like uh, it's a 100,000 type of uh, coordinates that you have to determine at the, the angstrom precision by crystallography, and it's, it's really a big challenge, and it was a very hard, very tough work. So the representation that we will use in the following is the so-called arch representation of the secondary structure of RNA. So I'm not interested in the geometry for the moment because, of course, what's interesting is the 3D structure of the RNA. But the folklore is that if you know all the pairings like this, then this is constraining enough to determine the three-dimensional structure of the RNA. So the secondary structure would be given, so on the line, you put the sequence of bases as they exist along the backbone, and then by a dotted line, <coughs> you represent the pairings of the various uh, bases which exist on your RNA in its folded shape. Um, it's not possible to have any crossings? Sorry? Yeah. It's impossible to have any crossings? No, crossings exist. It, that's exactly what's called pseudonauts, and that's, what is, uh, that's where uh, matrix in theory comes in. Plain and things like that. Of course. Yes. So actually, uh, I will uh, read. Yes. How are the pairings determined? I mean, if you put how the pairings uh, determined? Would you have just the same base being paired no. really well with two different? So each. So it's a very directional uh, interaction. So it's a hydrogen bonds. So it's very directional. So if one base, if one base is paired with another one. It's like if you have an arrow, these arrows are saturated, so they, they don't interact with the next. But in another structure, they could be like this, interacting with other guys. But once they are paired together, I see. it's not that if you have I a see, see. standard like Coulomb interaction, yes. one particle will interact with everybody yes. around it. Here, one base will one interact one. only one one. It is, it is called, uh, it's something which you call saturation. And actually, it's very important because this is the key to the possibility of writing it as a, as a field theory. Because this generates the root theorem, which, uh, OK, we'll come to that. So there are various motifs which appear in uh, secondary structures. And I show here several um, planar motifs. So like this, when you have something like this in three-dimensional space, it, so you can represent it also like this. 
and it translates actually into a Phillips like this. So this one uh, translates into a hairpin loop. This one translates into uh, internal loop. This is called a bulge. And this is a multi-loop. And so these are planar secondary structures. And this is, for instance, uh, certain, uh, this is the real secondary structure of a certain RNA, of a certain RNA from biological RNA. And you can see all these motifs that uh, I showed before. So this is, uh, for instance, this is a nice hairpin loop. This is a multi loop. This is an inner loop, a bulge, a helix, etc. Now, in addition to that, you have pseudonodes. So pseudonodes are precisely graphs when you have crossings. So uh, typically, so the simplest pseudonode is this one, which is called the herpes pseudonode. So the topological representation is here, and it corresponds to a loop going like this and coming back like that. So it's a pseudonode, it's not a real knot, because this stem goes outside the loop, it doesn't go inside. If, it, if this stem went inside here, it would be a real knot. But because it goes outside, it's a pseudo knot, it, which means that if you pull it, it's a straight line. It's not knotted. So there are several types of uh, very simple pseudo knots. So the simplest one and the most abundant is the hairpin pseudo knot. This is the so called kissing hairpin. So the kissing hairpin is when you have two hairpin loops with bases here which are complementary on the two. So they can be far apart and they can bind. And this is a kissing hairpin. You can have a loop, bulge, uh, pseudo knot, etc. So what's interesting in RNA is that there is a small number of pseudo knots. And the number of, and typically when you look in the database, the number of bases which participate in pseudo knot represent typically 10% of the number of bases of your RNA. So if you have an RNA of, let's say, uh, 300 uh, bases, about 30 bases will be uh, participating in, R in uh, pseudo nodes. So now, how do you model RNA? So the simplicity of the RNA interactions compared to other problems of statistical mechanics come from two things. First, it's the saturation of interactions, which I discussed before, which is that once i and j, so if base i is paired with base j, that's it, they are paired, and they don't interact with the rest of the world. And the second <coughs> thing is that, yes, this uh, saturation, in fact, comes from the watson creek pairing. So in other words, you can define a, a matrix Vij, which specifies if you have a sequence a sequence of, uh, of bases, so if you have a biological sequence of uh, amino of um, bases, you can define the binding energy epsilon ij, which is the pairing energy of base i and base j. There is a chain rigidity constraint because um, essentially in order to make a loop, in order for two bases to interact, there must be distance by, by at least four. This is due to the persistence length or the rigidity of the chain. And then you can write that the partition function of secondary structure is a sum of all, is a sum of all possible graphs or all possible um, pairing configurations of the system. So Q0, the partition function of the system in this uh, in this approximation is one, that's the graph with no pairing, plus some i smaller than j of vij, it's where vij is the Boltzmann weight of pairing i and j. Then if you take the case with two pairings, you have three, uh, three types of graphs, two planar graphs, and one pseudo knot, etc. Uh, you do everything. You must do the combinatorics correctly. And again, because of saturation, each index appears once and only once, which means that you cannot, from one point uh, here, let's say, you couldn't have another arch going back. Each arch takes up one point, and that's it. So you can see that there is a very strong analogy between pairing graphs and finite graphs. 
And I will come back to that because this is, of course, the basis of, uh, of uh, all this. So it's known since a long time that it's possible to calculate exactly the partition function uh, of secondary structures, of planar secondary structures without pseudonauts by uh, writing uh, recursion relations. So planar secondary structures are arches, so which means that it's all the graphs without <coughs> any crossing. And you can use this representation, you can represent them like that, you can close this line to represent them like this. And if you define Zij, the partition function of all the system, of, of all the bases for the segment between points i and j, you have this simple recursion relation, Zik plus 1, Zik plus bj, etc. So graphically, it's very simple what happens. If you add one base from k to k plus 1, the new partition function from i to k plus 1, so the base that you added, either it's unpaired, so if it's unpaired, it's just zik, and this is just a dangling base, or it is paired with any base between i and k. So if it's paired between any base between <coughs> i and k, you have here the full partition function between i, j minus 1. Here you have the partition function between j plus 1, k. And therefore, you can write this recursion relation, where I remind you that the vij is even like this. So you can check easily that this recursion relation resumes exactly all planar graphs of RNA. And this is known since the mid-90s. And it is so well known that uh, there are servers uh, one, two very famous web servers, mfold and the Vienna package, which are uh, very sophisticated because they take into account a lot of details of RNA. What I described, of course, is extremely schematic, but there is uh, much more to it. Uh, the algorithm scales as n cubed because, uh, because you need to know zij, so if n is the size of your sequence, zij, there are n squared zij, and you have a summation here, and therefore it's a further n cube. So the rate of success is about 60% on transfer RNA, so 55 to 60%. <coughs> so this, of course, is only for planar, planar graphs, planar diagrams. Now, if you include pseudonauts, so this crossing, then uh, it has been shown that the problem mathematically is NP-complete, so there is no polynomial algorithm. So here the algorithm goes like N cube, but in the case of pseudonauts, if you allow for crossing, there is no more re simple recursions, and the problem is NP-complete. So one has to do something else. So the way to go, the way we proposed with uh, Tony Z is the following. First of all, if you consider just the problem of a sequence of RNA, then if you write a Gaussian or integral like this, so at, you introduce some scalar fields phi i, scalar variables, so at each side of the chain, you put one of phi i. So one would mean that your chain, the site, is empty. And phi i, so either if this is site i, either you're like this, or you have a field phi i emerging from the site i. And then when you extend this, this Gaussian weight tells you that you have to contract all the phi i's together by pair. And that will, of course, with, with a contraction weight given by this Vij, which is just phi i phi j. The fact that we use Vij minus 1 in the correlation function here tells you that the phi i phi j is just Vij. So, of course, when you do that, you can expand and you can see that you generate exactly all the graphs that was shown that were shown before, which are all the graphs of pairing of the RNA. For instance, in this summation, if you take the term with four with four legs, phi i, phi j, phi k, phi l, 
uh, it will generate these three graphs and the, exactly the three graphs you want with the correct weight, vij, etc. However, if you use this form, all these graphs have the same weight. And if you do that, you can convince yourself that you will have much too many uh, pseudonauts. Because pseudonauts, they are not, uh, they have exactly the same weight as the others. And the number of pseudonauts, of course, grows very fast. And therefore, you will have much more than 10% pseudonauts in your system. So what you have to do is, so experimentally, we know that there are few pseudonauts in the structure. So you have to do something to, uh, to decrease the number of pseudonauts in the system. Um, <clears throat> and the pseudonauts are more rare because they pose some constraints on the backbone of the system. So for instance, if you take the H pseudonaut, in general, you have to do something like that. So you have to bring back, um, you have to bring back a strand of, of RNA, and usually it imposes some mechanical constraint, and this mechanical constraint could cost energy, and therefore this imposes a penalty, a mechanical constraint imposes some penalty which decreases the number of pseudonauts in the system. So we want to impose a penalty uh, to pseudonauts which doesn't depend on the number of crossings. So what does it mean? It means that <coughs> if, for instance, if I have pseudonaut like this, but if I have some additional pairings here, it shouldn't change the constraint <coughs> because what costs is really to come once and then doesn't, the, the penalty shouldn't depend on how many additional parallel pairings you can put. It should so it should depend on the complexity of the pseudonaut because uh, it's a characteristic somehow of the complexity of the pseudonaut. And it should be additive in the sense that if on my backbone I have a pseudonaut here and a pseudonaut there, it should be the, the penalty for the total pseudonaut should be the sum of the penalty for this pseudonaut and this pseudonaut. So these, of course, are basic uh, ideas which are uh, simple-minded uh, conditions to impose to, to pseudonym. So if you want to impose uh, this kind of topological constraints on your theory, what you want to do is to go from the scalar field theory uh, which was before, which was here, and the natural thing to do is to, do, to replace it by a matrix field theory where all the phi i, the scalar variable phi i are replaced by some n by n matrices uh, phi k of a and b. And then of course to have the correct scaling and to, to do things properly you need, so phi now are symmetric, uh, real symmetric matrices for instance, like this. So you need an n here and uh, you need a factor 1 over n here. So of course, when you have uh, such a matrix field theory, uh, if you start doing graphs like you do for the previous case, uh, you want to introduce double line graphs as they were introduced by Toth for, uh, in 1973. So instead of representing the pairing lines by a single line, you represent them by a double line. And then you just do the usual counting, and the usual counting is that because the propagator is n v minus one, it means that the double line, when it's a, a double line propagator, it will have a factor one over n. So for any propagator, double line propagator, you have a factor one over n. And since you have a summation over the color of the matrix, you have a factor n for each loop. <coughs> and then you have, in addition to the Boltzmann weight, which is related to the energy of the pairings, which is e to the minus beta, the sum of the epsilon ij that you have for all the pairings, you have a factor 1 over n to uh, the power, which is the power of this 1 over n, is given by the number of loops minus the number of propagators. 
So for instance, if you take this graph here, the weight, the n weight of this graph, this graph has one propagator, so factor one over n, and one loop, so the weight is one. Now, if I take uh, another graph, which is planar, of course, I will, won't teach you that planar graphs will be of order one. But now, if I take a pseudonaut, so for instance, this pseudonaut, which is in double line translated like this, so as you can see, if I count the number of loops, or the count, count the number of loops, I just go around and I go around like this, coming back. So this graph has no loop, so zero loop, so means factor one, and it has two internal lines, two uh, pairings, so factor one over n, so this graph is of order one over n squared. And the, th the, the theorem is general, that planar graphs are of order one, and uh, planar graphs are of order one, and pseudonauts are of order at least one over n squared, and Therefore, they are in the higher order in 1 over n. So, the Hartree planar diagrams are for the 1, so the nodes are for the of higher order, 1 over n. So, the matrix field theory, the matrix field partition function, in fact, has this form. It's a sum over all pairings. So, this is e to the minus beta, the energy of the pairing, so the standard energy. And then you have a factor which is 1 over n to the 2g of pairing. So, g is the genus of the pairing graph, which I will come back to in a second. And uh, so, this is the weight for each of these graphs. So, of course, if you take all the graphs of zero genus, these are the planar graphs, so these are the, the Hartree graph or planar graphs. And the difficulty is to, to try to calculate the graphs with higher genus, higher genome. So this brings to a, a, a natural a topological classification of RNA fold. So an RNA fold will be characterized by its topology and in particular by its genus. So if I take, for instance, this graph, so what you do is you put, the, so this is considered so these two uh, pairing lines, you put them outside, and this is a puncture in your sphere. So this graph, when you put these two pairing lines outside, you can uh, map it onto a sphere, and therefore, and the genus, of course, as we know, is the minimum number of handles of the embedding surface. So in this case, of course, the graph has genus zero. So the genus zero is the sphere, so you can have complicated graphs with genus zero. And then if you take, for instance, a kissing hairpin, so this is typically a kissing hairpin, and you see that the kissing hairpin can be embedded on a torus by, so these three lines are the red, so here they became four, I think, but in fact they are three. And uh, these, uh, hairpins here are just around a small circle. You see, of course, that if I have an additional parallel line, which means that if the helix is a bit longer, it's not going to change the, the genus of the graph. Same for here. So I can have as many, so it's invariant with respect to the number of, uh, of parallel lines or of crossing. And therefore, it's a good characterization of the graph. So this is a bitorus. So this is, for instance, the embedding of a more complicated graph. This is the way you put this graph on the bitorus. This is a tritorus. And uh, of course, this suggests that uh, since parallel pairings don't change the genus of the graph, when you have things like this, the graph is reduced to one line, this one like this, etc. So there is a simplification of the, of the topology of the graphs. And there is another concept which is uh, interesting, and which is that the concept, of course, when you do field theory, the concept of irreducibility. So a graph is irreducible if it cannot be disconnected by cutting a line. So here, of course, this graph is irreducible, this one is not. And the interesting thing is that if a graph is non irreducible, the genus of the graph is the sum of the geni of the two of the various components of the graph, which means that the genus 
is additive, and therefore, the penal if you put a penalty, which is what we will do, we will put a penalty, an energetic penalty, for each graph, which is proportional to the genus of the graph. So if it's proportional to the genus of the graph, the penalty will be additive. Same for nested graph. So uh, nested is when you cut two lines, so you can say that this graph is nested inside this one. And again, you can show that uh, nested graphs are, uh, the genus of nested graphs is additive. So this is just to simplify the topology of the graph. So if you look now, what are the, so we call a, a graph, to, we say that the graph is primitive if it's irreducible and non-nested. And if you look, what are the graphs which are with genus one, which are irreducible and non-nested? There are only four. The H pseudonaut, ABAB, the kissing hairpin, ABA, BBC, ABA, CBC, so it's these two, which are very frequent. Then there is the ABC, ABC graph, and then the ABC, A, D, B, C, D. So all these three graphs have been observed in the database, and uh, they have been measured and seen. This one has not been seen. So this is an example of uh, ABC, ABC graph uh, in, this, uh, in this RNA fragment. <coughs> so the com to now, computationally, to compute the genus is, of course, uh, fairly simple. It's just using the, the rule of, uh, of double lines. So P is the number of pairings, L is the number of loops. So the genus of a graph is the number of pairings minus the number of loops divided by two. So what you do is you dedouble the lines, same here, and you then you color to see how many loops. So here you will have two loops, here one loop, and so here the genus is two minus two equals zero, and here the genus is one. So this can be done algorithmically very simply. It's not complicated and it can be done iteratively. Also, but uh, okay, I have no time to come back. So we have done um, analysis of of all the structures in the PDB, and what you find is that uh, the number of bases in the PDB in the, the PDB is the database. It's the protein data bank, database which contains all the known structures of protein, RNA, DNA, etc. It contains quite large number of uh, kind of object. <coughs> In particular, it contains 1, 000, a little bit over 1,000 RNA structures, autonomous RNA structures, which means alone. And the maximum total genus of a structure uh, is about 18, and the maximum genus of primitive knot is 8. Okay. Uh, so I will skip all this. So, uh, of course, an interesting, uh, there is an interesting uh, problem of combinatorics in this. You can ask, uh, what is the number of RNA graphs uh, with given genus? So the number of RNA graphs with given genus can be obtained from this matrix integral, where with a, with one, it's a one matrix integral. So essentially, if you allow any pair to be formed, so any any base to pair with any base, you get a one matrix integral, which is given by this, and which you can calculate using your favorite methods. And uh, so you find that the asymptotic behavior of the number of graphs uh, of genus G scales as an exponential to the power L, and L to the power 3G minus 3 over 2, with a coefficient kg, which scales like this. Uh, and the total number of uh, the total number of diagrams of RNA graphs is given by this asymptotic formula. So, in fact, the interesting thing is that the average genus of all graphs scales like the length is proportional to the length of the graph with a quarter with a factor one quarter. So in the in the case of uh, in the case of RNA, 
for RNA up to size 3000, which is what is found in the database, that would give about a genus of about 700, an average genus of about 750, whereas the genus, the maximum genus observed experimentally is about 18. Uh, if you include self-avoidance of the chain, uh, then the genus, average genus goes from 0.25 to 0.13, it doesn't make much difference. So it's still, in other words, there is a lot of design, biologically, to bring down the genus from these uh, hundreds to 18. Okay, so how do we use this to, to um, predict RNA structures? So one uses a free energy parametrization, so you need to parametrize the epsilon ij's, the, the pairing or the stacking energy, free energy. So stacking is a generalization of pairing, but essentially it's like the pairing. You need a certain number of other quantities which I didn't discuss, penalty for making a loop, penalty for bulges, etc. And the new thing for pseudonaut is you put a penalty which is proportional to the genus of the pseudonaut. So the total uh, free energy of the system is e to the minus beta e of the parent minus mu. Mu is this penalty proportional to the genus. And of course, if you relate it to this matrix field theory, the e to the mu is 1 over n squared. So the first idea one could have <coughs> is to use a Monte Carlo method where you add, where you add a pair or you remove a pair and you so you can do this possible move, you take two bases which are impaired, you add the pairing, or when you have a pairing, you remove it. There is a certain number of sets which are ergodic and such that when you do these moves, the energy and the genus of the graph can be changed. So what you do, you calculate the delta E, you calculate the delta G, and you accept or reject with this probability. Of course, this method is not good for helices because uh, helix can be like 10 bases long. So if you have to open a helix, it's very bad, very difficult because you have to go up hill all the time, 10 times in a row, so you will never fit, especially at room temperature. So you must use another algorithm for the calculation. Uh, and the way to do is to do structure building. So essentially what we do, I will show it on the graph here, is you make a library, so given a biological sequence, you make a library of all possible paired sequences. So you can make, given this, uh, given the, the biological sequence of your RNA, you can make fragments like this, you can make bulges, you can make uh, inner loops, and so, and each one has a given free energy because it corresponds to a certain pairing, frac uh, stacking, and uh, loops, internal loops or bulges, which have a certain penalty. So each of these guys make up a library that you can prepare in advance, which, which each has a certain free energy. And then uh, you have to combine them to make a graph. <coughs> so in such a way that, of course, it's all the bases which are in one of these guys cannot be in the other. So there are some compatibility rules. And then you complete once you have put as many as you want in the system, you complete with empty bases. In other words, you, you complete the graph. So then, uh, what you can do, you can, so there are two, we have used two ways to do it. One is, uh, so once you have generated such a graph, you compute the genus, you compute its free energy, and therefore you have a, a library so there is two ways to do it. For short enough sequences, you can do this extensively and get the exact enumeration of all the possible fragments and therefore of all the folded structures. And then you calculate its free energy by doing this, uh, by using this parametrization. And uh, doing this, then you look what is the one with lowest free energy. And the enumeration can be done exactly for sequences up to 150. If you go to size above 250, you can do exactly the same, but by Monte Carlo. So by, you have this library of fragments that you can add or remove, 
And by doing that, <coughs> you have a delta E variation <coughs> of energy, variation of genus, and then you accept or reject by uh, stochastically with a metropolis kind of, uh, of scheme. So you can do that in simulated tempering at different temperatures or and exchange the temperature, and then it works up to sizes 1,000. So we have done a server, a public server, web server, which is MacGenus. The program is called MacGenus. So uh, the program uh, is here. So this is the way it looks. So this one is for exact enumeration. This one is stochastic enumeration. So it's very easy to use. You just enter here the sequence, your biological sequence, and then you click here, either on MacGenus or the other one, TT and E, and this is another constraint. And here you can fix some parameters, so there are some default parameters for the genus penalty and things like that, and you just run it, and uh, the result comes out uh, in the form of uh, a certain number of uh, lowest energy structure, which you can determine. You can decide how many structures you want. And this is, for instance, the HDV. So it's hepatitis delta virus. And uh, you see that uh, compared with the exact folding, it predicts 93% of the correct bases. And, uh, and the structure that you see has a genus 2 which is not obvious, but it's uh, right. So what I want to stress is, I can show you the statistics, but uh, this is a comparison of a uh, certain number of, uh, certain number of uh, <coughs> RNA folding schemes, and our method is by far uh, the best one and gives the best results at present. So, what about real nodes? So I will not have, do I, do I have two minutes? One minute. Okay, so um, real nodes, of course, it's a different question. Uh, there are real nodes in DNA, and they can be extremely complex. There are real nodes in, they, in proteins also, and the question that we asked was, is there real nodes in RNA? So I have been talking about pseudo-nodes, but real nodes is a real question also. And for instance, in polymer theory, you can show that the probability <coughs> of no knots in a sequence of length n decays exponentially with n. So, the question is there any knots in RNA? So, if you look into the PDB, in total you find that there are 6,214 distinct RNA chains which are either small fragments or hybridized with other molecules. So what we do is we, we circularize this chain <coughs> using a scheme which is called the minimally invasive scheme. So by taking the two ends of the chain and then we compute the Alexander polynomial and Docker code. So there are many, many knots in DNA, many knots in, in, R, in proteins. Is there any knots in, in RNA? And the answer is we find three structures, three knotted structures. Uh, these three structures are here. They are pretty long structures. Uh, and they are all solved by a new method which is used uh, since a few years, which is cryo-electromicroscopy. And to make a... So these are the three knots which are observed. The trefoil knot, the 4-1 knot, and the figure of 8 knot. And what the conclusions we get and I will not, uh, is that one of the structure we are very sure that there is a mistake in the, in the determination of the, in the extraction of the 3D structure. Now the two other structure, they may have real knots, but we have compared them with very close analogs, very close homologs, and they have no knots. So it's very likely that even these two structures may have no knots. But in any case, knots are very rare in RNA, much, much rarer than in DNA or even in protein. And in fact, we believe that there is no, no real knots in RNA, contrary to the two other so-called strands of life. So
So we can, you can design easily RNA nodes. I do not have time, so I come to the conclusion. So to the conclusion, to improve our algorithm for prediction, we need a refined energy model. Uh, and especially, one thing is one would be to include steric constraints. Uh, when you have planar graphs of RNA, there is no steric constraint. Any secondary structure graph, any planar secondary structure graph can be realized in a three-dimensional space. However, when you have pseudonauts, it's a completely different story because, for instance, if you want to make a structure like this, this strand, because of the rigidity of the double strand of RNA, this part should be longer than this one. So there are many topological, uh, many steric constraints uh, which are not present in this uh, topological kind of algorithm, in this uh, representation, and this is one of the reasons uh, of uh, failure or uh, of limitation of this algorithm. And the last question is, are there nodes in RNA? And the answer is probably no. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So there is a very basic thing I don't understand. So my understanding is that RNA is produced in line, base by base. Yeah. And when does the um, pairing happen? Does it happen uh, in line? It goes out of the line of them. So RNA. So it has to first. Um, this is a very long structure, yeah. so it okay. doesn't start pairing. No, no. Okay, so there are, the RNA is transcribed <coughs> from the DNA. There is an RNA polymerase which reads the DNA and which uh, reads the. Uh, RNA, and then the, the, the thing will fall. Because um, then there is a, in a way, a history um, element, because if, if, it's, if it can start pairing while it's being produced, that means a the strict energy minimization will um, equally prefer certain structures with the same energy, whereas if you include some sort of a dynamics approach, might get more accurate numbers. So you want you want to say that this is in favor of nodes or? Uh, I don't know. Is the there is some dynamics there that is completely ignored? Yes, but uh, we are talking about thermodynamics, right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, okay, so you know that there is there is reversibility in all this. So if you take an RNA or it's the same with proteins, you heat them up to unfold them and you fold them back. Mm -hmm. Now it's a completely different mechanism. You get to the same structure. And this is very normal. Okay, so it happens biologically, like the temperatures are high enough that you can get... No, that's in vitro. In vitro. Uh, actually, it even happens uh, biologically. Uh, for instance, when you have proteins which are... So for proteins, I don't know for RNA, but for proteins, if you have a heat, if you put a very high temperature to a protein, it will, uh, it will unfold. And... Uh, and then there are uh, proteins which come to the rescue, which are called chaperonin. And the chaperonin will help the protein to fold back into its right fold. And the right fold is the same as the initial one. And this is well known. This, this is non experimental. <coughs> so that's why people believe it's a thermodynamic, it's a quasi thermodynamic uh, process. So there are questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Did I understand right that there, there are four uh, uh, nodes, I'm sorry, the pseudo nodes of gene zero? Of gene, uh, one. gene is one, sorry. Yeah. Uh, three of them have been observed, yeah. and the, third, the, the fourth one, what's I've the state? Does that mean it doesn't exist? No. Does it mean that your, your genes, uh, that the penalty attached to the genes has to be reconsidered? Yes. That's what I think. What I think is that there is a penalty for genes, and there is also a penalty for crossing in the primitive graph, in the reduced graph. Which was the case of this third, uh, this uh, fourth graph? Because this fourth graph has uh, more crossings. So if I take this. Uh, <coughs> yes, so this, so you see, in this reduced representation, this one has one, and this is the, by far the most frequent. This one has two crossings, and it is less frequent. This one is quite rare, and this one is absent. So I believe there is, in addition to the genus, there is an additional penalty, which is related, to, which at least phenomenologically could be 
related to the number of crossings of the of the of these uh, primitive graphs. But then it's uh, so this is actually one of the subjects on which I'm working right now. How to implement this? Okay, I think we should ask further questions at the coffee break. So, uh, but first, let's thank Henri again. <laughs> <laughs>